darkness. Today is part two. We read chapter two, and the title of today's sermon is A Faith That Works. A Faith That Works. In this chapter, actually, the writer is James, Jesus' half-brother. James, the central message, his thesis message, the main point of this whole five-chapter letter, we read it here in chapter 2. Main point being, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. James here is answering the question, hey, what is genuine faith? What does real saving faith actually look like? He's answering that question here today. So we must ask ourselves, I invite us, all of us to ask ourselves this challenging question, how real is my faith? How genuine is, is my faith in Christ, in the gospel? Did you know that the letter of James, did you know that it was somewhat controversial? There's a reformer, famous reformer by the name of Martin Luther. He wrote the 95 Thesis. Some of you guys are familiar. Did you know that Martin Luther, he actually questioned the validity of James? Martin Luther actually thought James shouldn't even be in the Bible. Isn't that interesting? Martin Luther, I, I quoted him many times in my sermons. The reason why is he misunderstood this letter to be about salvation earned through works. You got to understand his context here, what he was going through. Martin Luther, he was fighting against strong legalism in the church. The church was selling indulgences for money, for the forgiveness of sins, among other things. The church was preaching the very opposite of what James is saying here. The church was saying, hey, you got to do, 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 do this in order to gain salvation. And Martin Luther was fighting that. So anything remotely close that had anything to do with works, he was like, nah, that's, that's, not, that's not it. That's his context here. He would quote and agree with, he would echo Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. He says, for by what? By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Luther, actually, he failed to recognize that what James was saying was actually not mutually exclusive with what Paul was saying. Actually, what Luther missed was that what James is teaching is actually complementary. It complements grace by faith, meaning we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, but saving faith will have works that is produced. It comes together. You read in the next verse in Ephesians, Paul also says this, Paul says, we are his what? Workmanship, come on, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He says also to Titus in chapter 3, verse 8, this is a faithful saying, that these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to what? Maintain good works. Good works and faithfulness in like our spiritual disciplines, when we read the Bible, when we go to church, when we pray, and, and our obedience, these things are to be the fruit of our salvation, not the root of our faith. Let's look at this tree here. What I'm trying to say is this. When you look at this tree, this is what James is fighting against. James is saying, hey, it's not our works at the root. It's not what we do. It's not you guys, us coming to church and us doing Christian things that lead to the fruit of us being saved. He's saying the opposite. He's saying this. No, we are saved by grace through faith. And when we understand that, when that happens and the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of our hearts, that becomes a reality that leads to the fruit of good works. The reason why 
we are to be preaching, that we are to be in obedience, that we are to be faithful in the things that God has called us to be faithful to, it's because He has saved us by sheer grace. That ought to impact our lives. You guys agree with me? Amen. Amen. So salvation, this is what James is trying to say. Let me just ram it in here. So important. James is saying this. Our salvation is not attained through faith and works. Faith and works. As in, hey, James is not saying, hey, okay, you know, you're saved by grace through faith, but you got to actually attain it too, faith and works. But, you know, no, God is saying, hey, I pay the bill of your debt. Stop trying to pay the tip. God is saying, I pay the bill and I pay the tip. He paid it all. We have nothing to contribute but our sin. It's not faith and works. Also, our faith, our salvation is not faith versus works. It's not choosing quote-unquote faith where, okay, I believe cognitively the gospel or choosing that between, hey, works, I need to attain. That's straight legalism. It's not that. It's this. It is faith that works. Faith that works. Genuine faith produces good works. So if you're taking notes, I did a little teaching right there. I see your brother Josh visiting from Taiwan. I went to seminary with him. I'm reminded of those times. I'm preaching, we're preaching what we learned, right? <laughs> Point one, a faith that works is a faith that is maturing and active. Maturing and active. A faith that is alive produces good works. One of the activities during the pandemic that people took on, including myself, um, I've been taking, I have, this, I have this New Year's resolution of wanting to perfect making sourdough bread. And so I've been researching, watching all these YouTube videos, how to make bread. I've never baked ever. I want to challenge myself. I've, had, I've made it four times already, and I have a long way to go. When making sourdough bread, all it is is flour and water, a little bit of salt, and some thyme. And in order to make sourdough bread, you need to begin with what you call a starter. And with the starter, what it is, is basically the yeast that we need to put in with other flour and water for it to grow when you put it in the oven. To make a starter... What you do, what do you get? You get water and flour, you mix it up, and you leave it in the room for one full day. And what ends up happening, it begins to ferment. It catches the bacteria in the air. And then you throw half of the starter away, and you, what do you do? You feed it again with water and flour. What happens? The bacteria begins to eat the fresh flour, and it begins to be active. You do that every day for about two weeks, and what happens is this. After one full day, when your jar is filled with starter this much, and you feed it, you feed the bacteria, the next day you wake up, the jar is all the way to the top. There's bubbles all up in it. You see what I did in my first batch of trying to make sourdough. I actually was not patient. I got a starter, and I try to, you know keep feeding it for maybe only like barely a week. And I tried making sourdough. And when I took it out of the oven, guess what? I cut it and I opened it. It looked like duck. No bubbles, no bread rise. Why? The starter was not mature yet. It was not active yet. And as more time, I kept feeding the starter again. After about a month of feeding the starter, I finally baked my own bread. I cut it open. Ooh, it was beautiful. Open it, it's like there was a rise, very even in the, in, in the spread, and the bubble it tastes delicious. Anyways, why am I talking about sourdough? I actually uh, saw in a, there's a tweet that said, sourdough starter, making sourdough starter is like the Tamagotchi for people in their 30s. <laughs> if you don't know what a Tamagotchi is, look it up later, all right? You just have to keep feeding it, keep feeding it, keep feeding it, all right? 
The more active the starter is, the more healthy bacteria and yeast is, which brings a rise to the bread. The less active it is, there's no rise to the bread. Brothers and sisters, you and I, by the grace of God, we've been given the gift of faith by salvation. We can't earn it. But did you know that we can't be passive with this faith? We need to be active, and we need to keep feeding this faith. We need to keep feeding this faith with the Word, flour and water, with the Word and with the Spirit. We need to keep feeding this faith in our obedience. We keep practicing. We keep obeying what the Word of God says. In our faith, it begins to mature. When our faith begins to mature, we begin to enter into this world, bringing rise and influence to the world around us. A faith that works is a faith that is maturing and active. Faith in Jesus means faith in His life, in His words, in His teachings, in His commands. It means to obey all these things. That is active faith. James says here that, hey, you can believe in the existence of God, but still live like a demon. Still live like a demon. You can, we can acknowledge cognitively what the Bible says, acknowledge that Jesus is real, but really not have active faith is what he's saying here. So the big question is, are we maturing in our faith? Are we maturing in our faith? What evidence can we testify and share that faith has been active in my life? How has faith in the gospel, faith in Christ, how has that really been changing our attitudes and our beliefs and the way we see one another and the things that we, the, the temptations that we fight? What is the evidence of your life? Is faith active or passive? Are you feeding that faith? There are many things to show as evidence, actually, as a fruit of our salvation. Today, we're just going to hone in on one of them, as James talks about here. One of the big fruits of active faith in our lives is the new way we view and treat people. The new way we view and treat people. A growing faith in the gospel eradicates the sin of what we read about partiality. Can everyone say partiality? Another word for this is favoritism. Verse 1, show no partiality as you hold the, hold the faith in our Lord Jesus. Partiality in the Greek is prosopolepsia. There's two, root word, two words in the prosopolepsia. Prosopol means actual, actually face. Lepsia actually means to receive. Partiality What it literally means is to receive things and judge things just on surface level face value. It is is giving or not giving special treatment based on outer experience. Being shallow. Unfair bias comes from partiality. Partiality, what it does, it creates a caste system. It cultivates a condescending attitude. It begins to create levels on humans. And it builds a superiority complex, very superficial. The effect of partiality, actually, we've been learning this in our Bible studies, is self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. What are some forms of partiality that we see in our everyday lives? Classism. Racism, nationalism, tribalism, tribalism even amongst the church. Which style of church is the better one? Mm. We see, we got to remember, James, who is he writing to? He's writing to new Jewish Christians, Jews who became Christians. All of a sudden, they're learning a new kingdom perspective. All of a sudden, they're learning, hey, wait a minute, these Gentiles are coming into the church. And James is saying here, show no partiality or favoritism based on these outer, superficial, superficial, shallow criteria. In the kingdom of God, children, children, 
and the poor in spirit shall inherit the kingdom. You know, this is so, like, in different cultures and contexts, this passage is so important. It's important for all of us. When I was doing missions in Gambia, in Africa, and we were, when we were doing, uh, going around visiting different churches, I was actually, it was a culture shock for me in many ways. One of the different culture, one of the culture shocks, I got introduced to this idea of tribalism. I would go to a church, and even in Gambia, there are so many different tribes and languages. I mainly work with the Mandinka tribe. And I will go to a Mandinka church, and soon enough, as I would get to know everyone, everybody's only Mandinkan. I would visit another church. I realized nobody's Mandinka, they're Jolof. See, there are all these, you guys maybe not, may not know what that is. But I ask around, and they still have these things that the gospel is working out in their hearts they view different tribes as inferior. It grew up in their culture. And it's the gospel that's transforming their hearts, saying, hey, these pastors are kind of waking up to the Spirit and saying, hey, we need a church of one new man. We need a church where there's no partiality. Galatians 3.28 says this. You guys know this. There is neither Jew nor Gentile race. Neither slave nor free status, nor is there male and female gender. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. He's addressing partiality here. Ephesians 2, 14 to 15. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Here we go. That he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. You see what the gospel does here. John MacArthur, I love this, he said, he said this, the gospel is a great leveler. The gospel is a great leveler. I love that imagery that in, in the Bible talks about in the end times when Jesus returns. It says that every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain made low. And I just see that it's just a great image of the gospel. And when Jesus returns, it's going to be the, the manifestation, the completion of the leveling where there will be no partiality or favoritism. A faith that works is a faith that is maturing and active. Point number two a faith that works is a faith that is a, is a as we talk about is a faith 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 sorry a faith that works is a faith that changes how we value all people i mean uh, i watched this show on netflix uh, it's called uh, <clears throat> love is blind <laughs> um, <laughs> this show how many of you guys watch that show what, it's, a, it's a dating show. I don't know. Why am I watching this kind of? I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to be cultured. I don't know. All right. Love is Blind. It's about these singles. They're trying to, you know, find the love of their life. But the premise is they enter a room and there's a wall where they cannot even see each other. And people are trying to, you know, get to know each other. They're trying to eliminate the, the, the element and criteria of physical looks. Love is Blind, right? And then as, as a show goes on, they begin to know each other. Layer after layer, they begin to find this new criteria, whether it's race, social status, you know what I mean, or their job, how much money they, you know, all these things they begin to find out more and more. And I was thinking about this show, and I was actually thinking, like, I know it's a silly example, but I wonder what life would be like for us if we actually lived blind. Like, have you ever thought about that? Like, if we lived blind, I wonder how much of our lens of life would actually change and how we view people. I wonder how much we realize actually how shallow we are. I wonder if we lived in a church community where we actually couldn't really see each other. Would we treat each other differently? Would we approach one another differently? What would life be like without prejudice and partiality? All of us, if we're willing to admit it, 
we all have some degree of partiality that still needs to be sanctified in our hearts. We're all a work in progress here. James, he's speaking here of a rich and lavish man versus a poor man. The world defines success as rich and influential. Associating with those with the high class or the popular ones with, with influence, those influencers, right, which you can gain a sense of identity from out of association. We're there now, guys. We feel a sense of identity. We feel a sense of dignity just out of association with someone who is successful or popular or rich. I follow them on Instagram. <gasps> they follow me on Instagram? Crazy. I follow JM on Instagram. JM follows me on <laughs> No, I'm just playing. <laughs> you know, we gain a sense of identity from this. We are attracted to success and feed off of others' reputations of success. I'm not saying that it's necessarily wrong to seek out, you know, being an apprentice to the successful to learn from them. I'm saying it's wrong when we begin to view those without the notoriety differently. The rich man in this, pa- in this passage, he was flaunting and flexing his wealth, his status, all these rings on his finger. He was flaunting and flexing here. And to me, what this means for all of us here, it's not literally talking about, you know, I'm not judging you guys, uh, whoever's in here who has a ring on it, every finger. That's not, you know, it's nothing wrong with that, you know. What I take from this passage is this. It could be taken literally, but also people who may benefit us in any way as opposed to people who do not benefit us. Rich and successful can actually mean, oh, can that person benefit me? Will that person drag me down? Is this person a burden for me? In other words, are people to serve me or am I to serve people? That's what faith is doing in us. That reversal here. God has chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. James is quoting his half-brother Jesus when he says, Hey, blessed are what? The poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's reminding him, hey, of the royal law. Love your neighbor. Who is my neighbor? People that are different from me. Love your neighbor. It's the antithesis. It's the opposite of our natural tendency to show prejudice and partiality. Brothers and sisters, faith in Jesus, it leads to a change in sight. I preached a message a couple weeks ago called the honor lens. When we grow in the gospel, it changes how we begin to see people. And it changes how we begin to see ourselves. What we need to do We need to uproot and renounce all the worldly identities we have taken on and built. We need to uproot these things, and we need to take on the identities of Christ that he's given us. Meaning this, my worth, our worth, my worth and identity is not in my wealth and status. My worth and identity is not in my resume and what's on there. My worth and my identity is not in my church, tribe, or culture, or what kind of church I'm associated with. My worth and identity is not in my level of education. My worth and identity is not in my failures and past regrets. My worth and identity is not in in association with a certain tribe. My worth and identity is not in my title or abilities in the church. That last one, let me say that again. My worth and identity, it's not how much I can do in the church. My worth and identity is that I'm a child of God, saved by grace, that didn't deserve mercy, but I've been given mercy. He paid attention to me. He noticed me. He took me in. That's my identity. 
if we do not uproot these identities and reroute who we are in Christ, the fruit of partiality, it's going to peak its head. It's going to peak its head. We're going to start measuring and sizing people up based on these shallow criteria. Point number three, a faith that works is a faith that is sustained by mercy and produces mercy. Sustained by mercy and produces mercy. At the end of the day, why are we all here? Why are we all listening to the Word of God? At the end of the day, we need a revelation of God's mercy. It says here, James says, mercy triumphs over judgment. A heart of mercy destroys partiality. James is quoting Jesus again when Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. In the end, a life that doesn't extend mercy is a life that really doesn't have a faith that works. James is not teaching that by showing mercy, we merit mercy from God. The opposite, okay? We'll never do it perfectly. But to never show mercy and forgiveness, never not even to wrestle with it is to signify, am I really truly saved? Is my faith actually real? Here's the gospel truth. We were once enemies of Christ, enemies of Christ, objects of wrath, the Bible says. We had nothing to offer to merit an eternal relationship with the God of the universe. This relationship that we have, that we so simply just pray and talk with, we had nothing to do with. We could not achieve that. We had every reason to be rightly judged. We have every reason to be discarded. But God showed mercy. He noticed you. He noticed me. He came down into our mess. He sought us out. He pursued us when we had nothing to show. And He gave us dignity. He gave us a new identity. He gave us a destiny. He gave us an inheritance. When we encounter this kind of gospel mercy, how can we walk in partiality? It's interesting how James ends this chapter. He ends this chapter by giving two examples of people of true faith that works. James is very intentional about these two examples, actually. Remember, he's speaking to new Jewish Christians who are struggling with partiality and favoritism, looking down on people. The first person that James shows as an example of a faith that works is Abraham. Father Abraham and many sons, right? Abraham, he's known as the father of our faith because he truly believed not only the existence of God, but he believed that he was his God. The Bible calls him a friend of God. Did you know that Abraham obeyed God even before any law was given? This was pre-Moses, pre-Ten Commandments. Any code to kind of obey? Before that, Abraham already had a heart of obedience. He didn't just acknowledge that God is real. He lived a life of obedience. When God said, leave your home uh, home country, not knowing what it's going to look like, not knowing where it's going to go, he obeyed. When God blessed him with the son, and God said, lay him down on the altar, he obeyed. Though God showed mercy, right? Abraham was known to be a father of our faith. Abraham was honored and had influence in the Jewish community. Now, let's try to step into the shoes of these new Jewish Christians here. When James talks about Abraham, they're like, yeah, we respect Abraham. We're associated with Abraham. We're in his line. Abraham. 
He has notoriety. Of course he's a man of faith. Of course he has active faith. Of course he has genuine faith manifesting good works. It's Abraham. James, you're right. Great example. But the second example, the example that James uses is Rahab. Rahab the prostitute, he says. Rahab the prostitute, the Gentile. She was someone seen as poor and looked down upon, immoral and cast away. Imagine what the Jewish believers were thinking. Wait, 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 wait. Abraham, yeah, yeah, Rahab. Don't, isn't it crazy how James uses these two examples just to prove a point? Hey, case in point right here. How do you guys feel about that? Partiality. Partiality is still there. James, perhaps, is rebuking partiality that has developed in the Jewish Christians against Gentile believers that are about to come into the church. You see, Rahab, she's, she had nothing to give but our sin. She had nothing to offer but sin. I don't know. I could relate more with Rahab than Abraham. But Rahab, she acted upon she took action when God's people came to scout out the land. She took action to show hospitality, hospitality and to bring them in, to protect them. It wasn't even crazy extravagant. But at the end of the day, in her faith, in her heart, God saw that she had faith. An active faith, a faith that worked. So much so that in Hebrews chapter 11, known as the hall of faith, her name is included in there as an example. Maybe the Jews would want to relate with Abraham because of his influence and reputation, but not so with Rahab, but both were people of faith in God's eyes. James uses them as examples to teach us that genuine active faith isn't determined by outer, outer appearance, reputation, class, race, etc. Faith is found deep in the heart. Brothers and sisters, how do we see one another? What prejudices must be eradicated from our minds, from our hearts? What kind of people do we actually look down upon? What are our identities actually rooted in? Can I ask the praise team to come up as we close in prayer? So my three main points for today's sermon was a faith that works is a faith that is maturing and active. Number two, a faith that works is a faith that changes how we value all people. Number three, a faith that works is a faith that is sustained, sustained by and releases mercy. That is what we see here when it comes to a faith that is alive, a faith that works, a faith that is growing. Amen? Let's take some time to pray. I want to ask you to pray unto the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, would you walk me through my life? I want you to ask the Lord, can we ask the Lord, would, since I was born, would you walk me through my life? And would you show me the possible identities that I have taken upon myself? Not all of it is inherently sinful. And then I'd like us to ask the Lord, remind me of who I truly am in you. Remind me of my true identity, my new creation identity in you. That I'm a recipient of mercy. I'm a child of God. That is supreme. And 
and ask the Holy Spirit, just begin to, Holy Spirit, please begin to just change my heart. Detox this prejudice and partiality. Give me your lens, God. Change my heart through the gospel. Pour out your spirit, Lord. Help my faith to be active once again. Some of us in here, our faith have, have been passive for too long. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the grace to come alive again in faith, to live in joyful obedience, to live from mercy. I'm going to ask Brian to just, you know, just sing a song of praise over us as you guys are communicating with the Lord right now. Just you and the Lord. Speak to Him. Listen. He's walking you through your life. Let's go ahead and do that.